Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We return again to John, 1 John chapter 2. So far in our study of chapter 2, we've seen the general principle that as followers of Jesus, we must reject the world and all of its lures to us. The world is trying to be attractive to us and to attract us to it. We also see that we must demonstrate that we are actually followers of Jesus by our love for each other. We demonstrate to the world that we are truly followers of Jesus because we love each other. This morning, John continues to develop the same idea in this first section of today's text. And from there moves on to give us a warning of those who deny God. So our, our title for 1 John is that you may know. That you may know what? That God is light and has given us eternal life. Our title for this morning's message is Christ or Antichrist. Which is it? We have to decide which side are we going to follow, the side of Christ or the side of the Antichrist. This first section this morning that we're going to, uh, to look at, John continues in, in where we left off last week. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How we live should demonstrate what our heart is focused on. The reality is that what we're thinking about, what we're focused on in our life, comes out in how we live our life. And if we're living a life that is focused on the world, focused on worldly pleasures, it becomes clear, doesn't it, that that's not where we're aligned we do what, what, what we think about. What, you know, they used to say that, that what's in a man's heart comes out by how he speaks. Well, that's really a true statement. What our heart is focused on is how we actually act. Now, that may be a shock for some, but churches all across the world are made up of people that only act church-like for an hour on Sunday. But we're not called to come to a building called the church. We're not called to act a certain way for an hour on Sunday morning. We are called to be the church all the time. And how do we do that? We demonstrate that by our love for each other, our love of God. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is not at all... When we, look, when we look at the text, is John saying to his readers, don't have any fun, don't do anything that is enjoyable, don't do anything that you really like to do. I mean, after all, you either love God or you love the world, and the world is fun, and God is a stodgy old guy, right? No, that's not right. He's a blast. I like that. He's a blast. It's not at all what John is saying. He's not telling the followers of Jesus that they can't have fun. Guys, did you have fun this weekend? Yeah. I, I think having an opportunity to hit an adult with a, with a large ball at rapid speed is a tremendous amount of fun. Well, you, you need to be a smart adult and position yourself behind another child. I mean, child, ch ch child, children are expendable and they can be used for defense. <laughs> the, the, these guys just haven't understood that yet. That is so wrong. It is so true. Be a parent and jump in front. No, no. 
No, no. 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 Having grown up in youth programs like that, I recognize that the adult needs to be in the back so that the ball hits the child first. They're young, their bones are flexible, they'll adjust. My bones are not so flexible anymore. You can still enjoy stuff. You can enjoy your jobs. You can enjoy your grandchildren. You can still have lots of fun. You can go and do all the things, some of the things, that the world talks about. You can still enjoy that. That's not what John is saying here. That's not what Jesus is saying. You can't, you can't restrict yourself so that you don't have any fun. We have fun. I mean, just come to a Bible study around here sometime and tell me you don't have fun. Now, it may not be the same fun that a lot of people have. I mean, come to after hours sometimes. Tess has more fun than anybody you can imagine. It's always at Brian's expense, but it's a lot of fun. Well, usually yours, though. I do not deny the truth. Yes. When, when we see in the New Testament um, the world, it's not a general reference to the cosmos. It's not a general reference to, to the physicality of what we see. Typically in the New Testament, when we, especially in a passage like this, when we see world, it's a reference to, to the way things are done, to the ungodly things. You see, we have, a, we have a binary choice within Scripture. Follow the world or follow God. So they're, they're at odds. They're opposite, right? This isn't something that only John is talking about. We see in, in James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. James is, is making a very clear statement. It's a binary choice. God or the world? Does that mean you can't have fun? No. It means your focus of your life is on God and his direction for you and not on the world and the world's direction for you. It's a choice you have to make, not fun or no fun. It's a choice of God or no God. Clearly, the dichotomy between the world and God is, is where we're to be focused, either on the world or on God. Here, James makes it clear that people are aligned into two camps, the world or God. Back in 1 John, do not love the world or the things in, in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The last phrase of verse 15 is a little difficult. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is John saying that if we love the world, God doesn't love us? Would that be consistent with what else we've seen in Scripture, even in the same book? No. Clearly, he can't be saying that if you love the world, God doesn't love you or can't love you. Or is he saying that if we love the world... We do not love the Father. Remember, it's a binary choice. The world or God. If you love the world, and by love, I don't mean you enjoy the world. I mean your focus is on doing what the world wants. I'm sorry, you guys. I keep pointing to the world over here and over here to God, and, and I shouldn't do that. Maybe next week you'll sit over there. And maybe next week you'll sit. We either love the world or we love God. And by love, I mean we focus our attention, our desire, our heartfelt, this is what I really want from my life, is either God or what the world presents. How do we make that decision? Say that again? Yeah, exactly by the choices that we make. What we do, the, the actions that we show, what we do. What did John earlier say? By your love you will know that you are a follower of Jesus. How we care for people. What our attention is on. What our focus is on. Does that mean you can't go and watch a baseball game? No, it doesn't mean that. You can even enjoy that. I'm going to enjoy the race in Chicagoland this afternoon. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that my focus on, in life is on NASCAR. I know people like that. My focus on life is following God. 
but I can still enjoy other things. I'm, I'm sure the kids enjoyed this, this weekend all the things that they got to do. I remember doing that as a kid, and that was some of my highlights. I remember them vividly. But that doesn't replace my focus in my life. I think John is echoing what James says. We have the capacity to love God or to love the world. To love one is to not love the other. I keep saying it, but it's a binary choice. It's a one or a zero. That's all you get. You don't get 1.5. You get one or a zero. You can't say... I want to love God on Sunday from 10 to 11.30. And the rest of the time, I'm going to do whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. John goes on in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. John's building on the previous verse. If we love the world, we cannot love the Father. If the world draws people away from God, it's because they become focused on what the world has to offer. Desires of the flesh refers to sinful desires or lusts, as any, as, uh, or as one commentary states it, illicit bodily appetites. We've certainly seen this in our society as, as well in the time of, as John was writing. Sexual promiscuity was widely accepted in society that John lived in and wrote. Remember, there were four types of marriage in the Roman world. You could actually marry a woman for an hour. We call that prostitution today, but it was a legal system then. You like that, huh? It's one of the four types of legal marriage. Why? So they didn't get in trouble when they went home. They could say to their wife, it's legal. And she would say, doesn't make it right. But you understand how promiscuity affected the world around them. Or they could go to the temple and hire a temple prostitute as part of their worship. You see, the things that are going on in our world today, it's not new. The world has been, Satan has been taking the world away from God since the very beginning. The statement, desires of the eyes, that's an interesting statement that John makes here. We just need to think back to to 2 Samuel chapter 11. King David sitting on the roof of the palace. And he looks down into the city and he sees a, a young fair lady having her bath on her little rooftop. And he says, I want her. And they go get her. And he sleeps with her and ends up getting her pregnant. Now what am I going to do? Everybody's going to know. So what's he do? He commits murder on top of the other. He is king of Israel. A man after God's own heart. He commits adultery and to cover up the adultery he commits murder. The desires of the eyes. He looked and he saw and he fell into sin. The point of the section is that the world is focused on sin and drawing people away from God. Think back to the Garden of Eden. What happened when when Satan in the snake was talking to Eve? It's a matter of the eyes. She looked and she saw that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food. She was enticed to sin by her eyes and a little encouragement from Satan. You suppose there was a little encouragement from Satan for David or for all the things that go across our television screens today? I mean, you can't sell a car anymore without a scantily clad woman or somebody yelling huge. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Attracting us in a way. You notice that they don't put a 500 pound woman selling cars at, at, at Kia of Cape Coral. They, they've got to have a good looking woman 
to get guys' attention because we're stupid and we're focused on things of the world. That's exactly what God is saying. Did you say amen to that? Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> to that word stupid? Oh, well, you would, you would have been right to say that we're stupid. John states that sin is not of the Father. God did not create sin, but sin is directly opposed to God and to his focus for us. Look at the next verse. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. In this verse, John makes clear that what the end results in, the world is focused on sin, is passing away. The end result of sin is what? The wages of sin is? Wait, I only heard a couple of you say that. We should be able to say this pretty good. The, the wages of sin is? Thank you. What John is saying is, ultimately, there's no future in sinfulness. Sinful behavior ultimately ends up in eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. Now, I don't know how long forever is, but Linda's been gone over a week and it feels like forever. I can't imagine what it would be like to be separated from God for eternity. Just try to put some context in that. No potential to ever be present with God again. That's the end result of sin. That's what God is telling us when he says the wages of sin is death. The biblical definition of death is not the cessation of brain waves or heart. It is the eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is the eternal separation from God. Add to that the pain and agony of hellfire and brimstone. I can't comprehend that. When I think about that, I, I think, I really need to be busy about telling everybody that so that none of my friends, none of my family end up eternally separated from God in eternal torment. But that's the end result of sin. Eventually, as uh, we know from what John writes in the book of Revelation, the sinful world will be destroyed and sin and sinfulness will be confined for eternity to hell. We know what John writes in the book of Revelation. There will be a new heaven and a new earth and everything sinful and every person, sinful person will be bound forever in hell and the rest of the world will go on without the potential for sin in a new heaven and a new earth. Sin and all its potential and all of those that fell for it will be eternally separated. And those of us who follow Jesus will be with him forever, which is the flip side of what John has said. One side of the coin is the process of passing away for eternity being separated. The other side is going to live forever. Which side are each of us on? Which side of the coin are we on? Now, John kind of, kind of changes focus here in this next paragraph where he begins to talk about resisting the Antichrist. He, he made the point, decide which side of the coin you're going to be on, and then now that you've decided and you're on the side that follows God, you have a mission. You've been given a mission, and that's to resist the Antichrist. Look what he says in verse 18. And children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. As I was studying this, I, I thought, wow, that's really, a, that's really a complicated verse. First, notice that John again calls his readers children. He's making the statement that they are followers of Jesus, that they are adopted children of God, just like we are. 
He's recognizing that they are, they are redeemed, that they are forever with, will be with God. He's making it clear that he believes those he's writing to are followers of Jesus. He goes on to say it's the last hour. We have to figure out what John means by the last hour. Those who look at what John wrote in Revelation as having already happened and not yet future, they believe John here is talking about a specific end to a time period and not a a generic statement of a longer age. There are those that interpret the book of Revelation as already being history. They interpret what God has written and tells us about the future and they say that's already happened. They're called preterists. If you, if you want to read about them, they're very confusing. They really mess up the way scripture works. Brian just read a book on, uh, on that and, and he would come out from reading and his eyes would be going like this because that's not at all what we've been taught. But there are a group that believe that. They believe there won't be a millennial kingdom, that we're in the millennial kingdom now, except it's now 2,000 years, and we don't have a duo millennial kingdom. We just have a 1,000-year kingdom yet coming. But those who view that John writes in the Revelation as yet future, then what John writes here must be interpreted not as the end of the age, but as the last age. As as John is writing, he doesn't say the end of the age. He's saying the last age. What is the last age? I believe the last age is from Jesus' ascension until his return again. In other words, the church age is the last age. As as Jesus was ascending into heaven, remember the the text as, as the disciples are all there standing on the top of the Mount of Ascension, And and they're looking at Jesus and they're wondering, what the heck is going on here? An angel says, look, just as he ascended, he will return again. We have that to look forward to. So the intervening time, all the disciples thought Jesus would be returning later that day, the next day, the next week. It's called the imminent return of Jesus. It is a doctrine of the early church. They all thought Jesus would return immediately. Well, God in his wisdom has caused Jesus to wait now. We're now about 2,000 years. I don't know how long it will be before he actually does return. So when, when John says the last hour, he's making a statement about the period of time between the ascension and the return during the church age. So let's read it that way. Children, it is the church age. And as you you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. There will come a time when a specific Antichrist will come. So now many Antichrists have come. The many Antichrists are all those false teachers, all those people that are teaching other than what God has taught. They're they're teaching that, that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. How many have... uh, have actually become healthy and wealthy because they've been followers of Jesus. You know, it doesn't usually happen that way. Now, God may choose. I I knew a couple of brothers up in Indiana and Ohio that were very wealthy. The Rayco Electrical Box Company, they were the owner of, of that company and several other companies, and they had gazillions of dollars. But they were good Christian men that used most of their income most of their profit, to serve God. The church on Crystal, the property was paid for by one of those brothers. Majority of the building fund was paid for by one of those brothers. Church in Mansfield, Ohio, was paid for by those brothers. They were doing things to honor God. So being wealthy doesn't mean you're not following God. It just means God hasn't promised that to you. He may give it to you, but that's not what he's promised you. All New Testament writers viewed the second coming of Jesus as being imminent. He said, look, John, uh, John uh, here in, in verse 18 says, look, you're in that period of time when there are going to be people that oppose Jesus Christ. He calls them little a antichrists. 
John also uses the term antichrist here and elsewhere in his writing as a, as a statement of the, the overall concept of being in opposition to what God has taught. False teachers, prosperity doctrine teachers, or really what was going on in the time of, of John writing this is the new Gnostic movement that was taking over that was saying Jesus wasn't God. That Jesus wasn't the only 100% God, 100% man ever to exist. That he was a good guy. I mean, history books will tell you that. Most modern history books will ascend to the fact that Jesus was a real human being. We have enough evidence to say that. That he was a human being. And that's usually where they end. He was a good teacher, a good rabbi, not God. Denying the deity of Jesus Christ. If Jesus wasn't God, are we saved? No, absolutely not, because he wasn't qualified to give you salvation. But the early, there, were, there was a movement in the early church to discount Jesus being God. Yeah, he was a good guy, but he really isn't God. Or he's a lesser God. Mormons believe that. They believe Jesus and Satan are brothers. Spirit from a union of God the Father and somebody else. But you too can be at the same level as Jesus and Satan if you do your work right. So don't let anybody tell you that Mormons are Christians. They're not. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. That was a real problem in the early church. And John uses the term antichrist here and elsewhere in his writing to refer to those who, who denied the, the deity of Jesus. Look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. Again, it's another confusing verse. John seems to have taken some writing lessons from Brian and from the Apostle Paul, writing these, these long run-on sentences. John says, They went out from us, but were not part of us. Figuring out who the us is, refers here to, uh, who John is referring to here is a bit difficult. Some commentators believe that John is saying that the false teachers left the group of early church apostles and leaders. In other words, some say us means the early apostles and elders. Others then say that us is referring to the early church. At this point in my study, I'm not sure which is which. Both could be true. It could be that they left the group of apostles and elders, that they were some leaders in the early church that started following false doctrine. We know that happened. But it also may be that they were members of the early church and left and followed Gnostic teaching. So at this point, I'm not sure which us he's referring to here. John says that the false teachers departed from proper doctrine. If they'd remained in proper doctrine, they would have not left. Why do we have so many church splits? Because of what God says in his word and sticking to it. In 1989, the Fellowship of Grace Brethren Churches went through a split. One of many. In the fellowship, the split, this last one in 89, was all about whether or not Trying immersion is required for membership. There was a group in the, called the Conservative Grace Brethren Fellowship that believed Scripture taught that you have to be trying immersed to be a member of a church. Scripture teaches trying immersion, and it teaches membership, but it doesn't teach that you have to be trying immersed to be a member. And so there was a group of about 60 churches that left the fellowship because they believed Scripture taught something different, and we couldn't come to an agreement. I was present for some of those floor discussions at conference about that. And it was a difficult time. We lost some really good guys in really good churches over a difference of opinion of what God's Word says. So John is making the point here that 
some false teachers came in and they ended up leaving. Whether it's the group of elders and apostles or it's the church as a whole, it's hard to, hard to determine. But they left because they were teaching something false. Now, that's a good thing that they left. But John also tells us that they left and started attracting the church. They started drawing the church away. That would be like you leaving here and going to watch Joel Osteen on TV. Leaving to go to false teaching is what John is talking about here. In verse 20, he says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. We have in this verse another phrase of John that's hard to interpret. I used to think Paul was the most difficult to understand. I'm beginning to think John might be a little bit more, to, more hard, uh, harder to, a little harder to understand because he uses some phrases that don't necessarily mean what they appear to say. The, the natural reading of this, but you've been anointed by the Holy One. Who would the Holy One be? Almost everyone conclusively is going to say Holy Spirit. But I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's what John means here. So I was doing my initial read of and, and markup of the text as I, as, I, as I do as I'm studying this. I even wrote Holy Spirit over Holy One. I wrote HS over that just to remind me. And then as I began to study and as I looked closer at the context, I'm not so sure that's what he's saying here. So I studied the verse in the context. I became less convinced that Holy One is a reference to the Holy Spirit. We have three potential here for what he's talking about. He's referring to the Holy Spirit, or John is referring to the Word of God in general, or the Gospel specifically, or a combination of both, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And I think that's a better answer for it. That John is saying, listen, You've been anointed by God to understand His Word. How does that happen? As you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And one of the missions of the Holy Spirit is to illumine the pages of Scripture to you. So as you're reading Scripture, the Holy Spirit is helping you interpret it. I think John here is talking about a combination of the two. You've been given a blessing of having God's Word and the Holy Spirit to help you interpret it. Frequently, as we're studying God's Word, something will become clear to us. And we'll say, why doesn't everybody understand that? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit to make it plain to them. So I think John here is talking about the combination. When we're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us And then he gives us that that rich blessing of looking at his text and not beginning to under not seeing everything immediately. It's a process that excuse me, I got the hiccups. That you go through, that that you spend your life studying his word, and he he may illumine a page to you that you had read a hundred times before, and now all of a sudden, wow, it just makes sense. Like, how come I didn't see that before? That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. And I think that's what he's talking about here. But you have been anointed. You've been given a covering. What, what's the anointing a reference to? It's like when, when, when David was anointed king, oil was poured over him. When there was an anointing of the high priest, oil was poured over them. They were saturated by God in a blessing. That's what what John is talking about here. You have been saturated by the Holy Spirit. A blessing has given given to you so that you can interpret what God has said in his word. Now, it's okay you don't get it all because it takes a process. It takes time. It's part of, of God progressively revealing his word to us. So don't think that you missed out on something because you don't understand everything that the scripture writers write. It's a process of your relationship with God, of the Holy Spirit 
illumining pages to you as you go. Go on to verse 21. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. John reminds his readers, which by extension includes us, that he's writing because we do know the truth. He's reminding us, you have been given the truth. And the truth is contained right here. It's in his word. He's given us all of his word for us to know. We spent about a half hour this morning in Sunday school looking at words that talk about gathering. Why is that important? It's important that you know what God has said in his word. And so we go through his word, Genesis to Revelation. He's again saying that he recognizes that his readers are redeemed people. Now look at verse 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. By the time John is nearing the end of his life, we believe John wrote this uh, sometime 80 to 90 A.D., maybe 95 A.D. John's an old man. All the other apostles are dead 30 years by now. And John is the last one. He's the last one that had spent three and a half years with Jesus. He's the last one of the inner circle to be alive. He alone is left of the early apostles. As, as he's nearing the end of his life, the Gnostic movement was really beginning to push hard against John. Really beginning to push hard against what John had taught. Against what Jesus had taught. Against what Paul had taught. Part of what the Gnostics insisted on was that Jesus was not God. Was just a simple man. Given certain powers and abilities by God, but just a man. John makes it clear that those who make such claims are lying. They're not confused, they're lying. Especially those that had been part of the truth and left. They're lying about who God is. So how is denying the deity of Jesus denying the Father? In the triune Godhead, a plan was made by the Father to be carried out by the Son. To deny the Son that the Son is God, to deny the deity of of Jesus is to deny God the Father's plan. And it's to say, I don't believe you. You're not trustworthy to God. That's some hubris to say that. You are maintained and you are created and maintained by Jesus, the second member of the triune Godhead. And to say he's not God is to say, I don't believe you, God. You're not trustworthy. And I want you to know that takes a little bit of guts or a lot of stupidity. Look at verse 24 and 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abide in you, abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Remember what you were taught from the beginning, John says. Beginning of what? Yeah, I think maybe from the beginning of of God's word, from the beginning of Jesus' contact with humanity, from the beginning of, of, of life, we have been taught that God has a plan. As soon as Adam sinned, And God remarked to him, here's your punishment. And he began to teach about salvation coming based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. In the the curse given after the fall, God said there will be a Savior. And then God demonstrated that Savior by the shedding of animal blood and the giving to Adam and Eve of skin clothes. To begin the process. And then from from there, 
the, the book of, books of the Bible continue to build on that. And all the prophets are talking about the coming of the Messiah. And then the Gospels talk about the Messiah being there. And then the, the Acts of the Apostle talks about those apostles taking the word of God, the truth of Jesus on the cross, and spreading it around the world. The Bible from beginning to end talks about Jesus and the plan of salvation. The doctrine that John and the other apostles had brought to the church from the beginning results in eternal life of believers. When you believe what God has taught in his word, you will be saved. Eternal life. Not temporary life, eternal life. To be clear here, John is not talking about losing our salvation. If you, if you don't listen or if you stop listening, doesn't mean you lose your salvation. John never teaches that. As I was studying this, I looked at some commentators who, who don't believe in eternal security, and they were trying to make a case here that John is arguing that we will lose our salvation if we stop believing. In other words, it's all on you. Well, it's not on you. It's on Jesus. He holds you. You're not holding on to him, which is good. Look at uh, the last, pair, uh, last section, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need of anyone should teach you. But, he is, but his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you abide in him. Remember what you were taught. John says, you have been given that anointing, that is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to illumine the pages of Scripture. Study that, focus on that, stay attuned to that. There's no lie in there. There is no lie in here. Cool. There's no lie in here. This is all what God has told us is true about our life, our eternal life, by following Him. John here is reminding the true believers that they don't need to listen to false teachers. Holy cow, I spread everything everywhere. They don't need to listen to false teachers because they've already been given the true teaching. And they have that extra added bonus of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to go to Joel Osteen to listen to false doctrine. You don't even need to come here to listen to me because you have the ability to understand Scripture yourself. But God tells us to come together to strengthen each other. You see, you're coming here on Sunday morning is more for the other person here than for yourself. Do you ever think about that? When you come here, you're an encouragement to someone else. Now, I hope that you're uplifted. I hope that you learn and that you, you corporately worship and pray. But it's really a bonus to the other people when you walk through the door. And it may not necessarily be a bonus for you. So on those mornings that you feel like, you know, I just... I don't feel like going anywhere today. Just get your butt up out of bed and get here and be an encouragement to someone else. It might not be you. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I got good ears. I'm not singling anyone out. I'm singling everyone out. There are times you don't feel like getting up, but it's not for you. It's for the other guy. Think about that. That might change how you get up in the morning. Some have suggested that John was saying that his churches he was writing to no longer needed teachers. Well, they have the, teach, the great teacher of Jesus Christ, but that's not what he's saying here. John is simply saying that they don't need to be taught again the initial doctrine of the gospel. They have that. Now they get together to learn more and to grow and to develop and to become gathered together, solidified, to coalesce together as a force into the world. Our mission doesn't occur here. Our mission occurs out there as we go out into the world. We get prepared here for the mission out there. 
So what do we do with what we've seen this morning? We must always remember that what we truly believe will determine how we act. I love the statement that Dr. Del Tackett makes in the Truth Project. And the kids used to have it written on their board. Maybe you still do. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Do we really believe that what God wrote in his word is true? Or is this just some kind of social activity on Sunday morning for an hour and a half? I want you to know that we're sorely lacking if this is your social outlet. That's not what this is for. This is for encouragement and for development. It's because we really believe that what God has said here is really real. And so our life needs to reflect that. We've, been, we've seen that loving the world means that we really can't love God. Again, it's a binary choice. Love the world or love God. We have to make that decision. And when we make that decision, how we act will convey what decision we make. It's hard to hide it. Because if you made the decision to hide it, then you've made the decision not to love God. In other words, there's no undercover Christians. We've seen that loving the world means that we really can't love God. We've also seen that those who truly defect from the faith in God most likely have not been true followers of God. If someone defects from the faith, now I can't see into hearts, only God can, and so I have no way to know. But what I can tell you from what God has said in his word, that if someone rejects, looks like they've come to faith, and then rejects it and leaves, chances are the best that we can observe is they weren't believers in the first place. Now, I, I could get in a lot of trouble for saying things like that because we don't know who's saved. And all I can tell you is somebody that is truly saved, when they walk away from God, God's going to go after them. And he's going to start doing things to bring them back. Yeah, one way or the other. Now, it may take some time. So in the intervening time, I have no way to know what's in their heart. And so I'm not making a definitive station, a statement. I'm making a, a generalized statement that typically someone who, who departs from what looked like faith and doesn't follow Jesus and is anti-Christ probably wasn't saved in the first place. We've also seen the plan of Satan and how he's been working since the very beginning of the creation of the world from the very time that he fell to draw people away. To draw us away from what God has said in his word. From focusing on, on being followers of God and his word. Putting doubt into our mind. Is that really what God has said? Satan speaking into the ear of, of Eve. Are you sure that's what God's word is? Well, you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit to study His Word. And you should study it to know what He said. The plan of Satan is to draw us away from Jesus. And part of that is to deny the deity of Jesus. I don't know how they can call themselves a church, but there are churches all over the place that deny Jesus is God. If your Savior is not God, you're going to hell. It's just that simple. Now, I admit, I'm not very inclusive in that. But I'm just the reporter here. That's what God said. That's what Jesus himself said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's not a comma there that says, and Buddha, and whatever. It's but by me, period. Salvation only comes at the, at the blood of Jesus Christ, no other way. But churches all over the place deny that. And when you deny the deity of Jesus and that salvation comes only from him, you deny the Father as well. We must acknowledge that how we act shows where our heart really is. How we act 
really is the focus of our heart. So if you're not acting like a follower of Jesus, maybe your heart isn't a follower of Jesus. Do a self-inventory. Let the love of God inform you how you act and what you say. Let the love of God determine how you act. The world is only waiting for you to mess up. The world will be right there as soon as you mess up. And they will be right pouncing on you. Now, you're going to mess up. I'm pretty good at messing up. I, I've, I've demonstrated that a bunch. But the reality is that we can seek forgiveness from Jesus Christ. And the reality is we shouldn't give the world extra ammunition. We shouldn't let the world have all the, those cheap shots at us by, by loading them up for them. When you stand on top of the tee and you make yourself the ball to be hit because you have, you have done messed up, that's, your, that's on you. And you damage the cause of Christ when you do that. Don't give them any extra ammunition. While at the same time, hold tight to the doctrine that you've been taught. Don't allow Satan to distract you from it. Stay firm in your love of the Word of God and in God Himself. That's the, that's the takeaway. That we're to love Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, and to stay firm in our commitment to learn what God has taught us from the very beginning. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the reality that you love us, that you called us to be your children, and that you now empower us through the Holy Spirit to understand your word. Thank you for that truth. We love you, Father, and, and we look forward to serving you and to seeing men and women, boys and girls, come to know you. Help us this week as we seek to gather people to you. Not to us. Not to our mission, but to you and your mission. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.